The pathway to humans on Mars lies through the atom, split, far from Earth. Whether in the void or on another world, power is life. A steady, strong flow of electricity is as crucial for operating computers and engines as it is for assuring access to corporeal necessities, such as light and heat, breathable air and potable water, and preparation or even growth of food. And one of the most potent and reliable ways to get all those vital kilowatts is via nuclear fission, something aspiring astronauts realized long before anyone ever reached space or developed nuclear weapons. For that matter, Yet more than 60 years into the space age, nuclear fission for spaceflight remains mostly a dream. Now, however, as NASA pursues its Apollo-esque Artemis program to build a crude lunar outpost, a rare alignment of technology, funding, and political will is on the verge of making spaceborne nuclear reactors a routine reality. Welcome back to Tech Trends for All. Before we proceed, kindly subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon to stay updated when we release new videos. Without further delay, let's dive in. In 2020, the White House gave NASA a 10-year deadline to deliver a 10-kilowatt nuclear power system to the surface of the moon. The project is now a top priority of the agency's Space Technology Mission Directorate, and in July 2021, congressional appropriators earmarked $110 million for NASA to advance development of a new nuclear rocket suitable for sending cargo and crew on interplanetary voyages. NASA had not even asked for the money. The reason for this sudden urgency is simple. Without nuclear power, the space agency's stated goal of establishing a moon base by the end of the decade, let alone putting boots on Mars, becomes difficult, if not impossible, to achieve. Surprisingly, no fundamental technology breakthroughs are required to build a nuclear reactor for spaceflight applications. In fact, the U.S. already did so once and so far only once, with the Air Force's development and launch of a working prototype in 1965. Instead, the difficulty lies in navigating the complex web of regulations that surrounds all things nuclear, and in ensuring any chosen approach for nuclear power beyond Earth does not needlessly limit NASA to just the lunar surface or any other lone deep space destination. Ideally, the power of the atom could be harnessed not only for crewed missions to the Moon and Mars, but also for robotic exploration throughout the solar system. The goal going in is make sure that what we use on the moon from a fission reactor standpoint is also directly applicable for use on the surface of Mars, says Michael Houts, manager of nuclear research at NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center. Fission, he explains, is a pretty simple process. It's literally just the right materials in the right geometry, Houts says. That's why, once it was discovered, we very quickly had systems able to self-sustain a chain reaction. This differs completely from the radioisotope thermoelectric generators, RTGs, that power NASA's Mars rovers, the New Horizons mission to Pluto and beyond, and the Voyager spacecraft now in interstellar space. RTGs merely convert the heat released from naturally decaying plutonium into electricity. Fission reactors are far more powerful and versatile, splitting atoms from uranium fuel, and channeling the released energy into propulsion and electricity production. There are no physics breakthroughs needed, no miracles necessary. But just like terrestrial systems, you're going to need to have some really good engineering, Hout says. A long-delayed giant leap. NASA is publicly cagey about its Mars timeline. But since the first term of former President George W. Bush, the agency has steadily worked toward a giant leap on the Martian surface by the end of the 2030s. In 2020, NASA asked the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine to study the technical challenges, benefits, and risks of nuclear propulsion, with particular emphasis on a notional nuclear-propelled cargo launch to Mars in 2033 that would precede a human mission in 2039. In logistic terms, what such a mission would look like has scarcely changed since the 1950s. Three years before Yuri Gagarin's flight made humans a spacefaring species, NASA's precursor, the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics began a formal study of nuclear propulsion as part of a crewed Mars expedition. This investigation called for a 420-day expedition with 40 days at Mars. Other, more ambitious proposals have examined lengthier surface sojourns on Mars, stretching to around 500 days. But the classic mission profile has remained the dominant vision for crewed Mars exploration, driven in part by celestial mechanics and reasons of survival. To conserve fuel, both Earth and Mars must be properly aligned in their orbit, and technologically speaking, 
humans are not yet ready to cut the terrestrial umbilical cord and truly live off the land and space. The human body can handle the journey, as evidenced by decades of data from crews living and working on space stations in low Earth orbit. The current record for the longest continuous stay in space is held by the cosmonaut Valery Polyakov. Thanks to a vigorous off-world workout regimen, he was able to walk from his capsule after landing despite having spent 437 days in muscle-wasting microgravity on board the Soviet space station Mir. Upon returning to Earth, Polyakov's first words to a fellow cosmonaut reportedly were, We can fly to Mars. NASA's current goal for a Mars mission calls for a round trip of about two years. Nuclear propulsion would be a critical enabler. In addition to increasing the number of flight opportunities for a crewed mission, it would reduce the number of flights necessary to get the fuel for such a trip into Earth's orbit. Those fuel requirements are considerable. The International Space Station, painstakingly built via more than three dozen launches across a decade's time, is approximately 420 metric tons. A chemical propulsion system necessary for a round trip to Mars would require the very expensive task of lofting somewhere between more than twice to nearly ten times as much tonnage from Earth. Consider that the mightiest of NASA's rockets, the Space Launch System, SLS, which has yet to even fly, is slated to carry a mere 95 metric tons to space at $2 billion per launch. If or when the SLS is superseded by more capable and cost-effective rockets such as SpaceX's in-development and all-reusable Starship, that single launch mass limit will increase to more than 100 metric tons, and the price per launch should plummet. Even so, the financial calculus of a chemically-fueled Mars mission would still be daunting. If nothing else, today's push for nuclear power in space is a useful metric for measuring the seriousness of NASA's and the nation's lunar and Martian ambitions. In the context of human spaceflight, NASA has a well-known aversion to new, and thus presumably more risky, technology. But in this case, the old way makes an already perilous human endeavor needlessly difficult. For all the challenges of embracing nuclear power, for pushing the horizon outward for humans in space, it is hard to make the case that tried and true chemical propulsion is easier or carries significantly less physical and political risk. Launching 10 international space stations worth of mass across 27 super-heavy rocket launches for fuel alone for a single Mars mission would be a difficult pace for NASA to sustain. That is more than 40 launches, and at least $80 billion if the agency relies on the SLS. And such a scenario assumes everything goes perfectly. Sending help to a troubled crew on or around Mars would require dozens of additional fuel launches and chemical propulsion allows very limited windows of opportunity for the liftoff of any rescue mission. If, with a single technology, that alarmingly high number of ludicrously expensive launches could be cut down to three, while also offering more chances to travel to Mars and back, how could a space agency that was earnest in its ambitions not pursue that approach? No miracles are necessary, and regulators and appropriators seem to agree that the time has come. As Polyakov said, we can fly to Mars. Splitting atoms, it seems, is now the safest way to make that happen. That's all I have for you guys for today. If you liked watching this video, please make sure to click the like button, subscribe to our channel, and click the bell icon so that you may be notified when we upload a new video. Thanks for watching.